on YouTube and Facebook. Appendix to Chapter 1 Belzoni's Account of His Discovery of the Tombs of Seti I On the 16th of October, I recommenced my excavation in the valley of Beben el Malik and pointed but the fortunate spot which has paid me for all the trouble I took in my researches. I may call this a fortunate day, one of the best perhaps of my life. I do not mean to say that fortune has made me rich, for I do not consider all rich men fortunate, but she has given me that satisfaction, that extreme pleasure which wealth cannot purchase, the pleasure of discovering what has been long sought in vain, and of presenting the world with a new and perfect monument of Egyptian antiquity, which can be recorded as superior to any other in point of grandeur, style, and preservation, appearing as if just finished found in it will show its great superiority to all others. Not fifteen yards from the last tomb I describe, I caused the earth to be opened at the foot of a steep hill and under a torrent which, when it rains, pours, pours a great quantity of water over the very spot I have to be dug. No one could imagine that the ancient Egyptians would make the entrance into such an immense and superb excavation just under a turn of water, but I had strong reasons to suppose that there was a tomb in that place. From indications I had observed in my pursuit, the fellows accustomed to digging were all of opinion that there was nothing in that spot as the situation of this tomb differed from that of any other. I continued the work, however, and the next day, the 17th, in the evening, we perceived the part of the rock that was cut and formed the entrance. On the 18th, early in the morning, task was resumed, and about noon the workmen reached the entrance, which was eighteen feet below the surface of the ground. The appearance indicated that the tomb was of the first raid, but still I did not expect to find such one as it proved to be. The fellows advanced till they saw that it was probably a large tomb. They protested they could go no further, the tomb was so much choked up with large stones which they could not get out of the passage. I descended, examined the place, pointed out to them where they might dig, and in an hour there was room enough for me to enter through a passage that the earth had left under the ceiling of the first court which is 36 feet 2 inches long and 8 feet 8 inches long, 8 inches wide, and when cleared of the ruins, 6 feet 9 inches high. I, perso I, I perceived immediately by the painting on the ceiling and by the hieroglyphs in basso relievo, which were to be seen 
to a staircase 23 feet long and of the same breadth as the corridor. The door at the bottom is 12 foot high. From the foot of the staircase, I entered another corridor 37 feet 3 inches long and of the same width. Each side is sculptured with hieroglyphs of basso relievo and painted. The ceiling also is finely painted and in pretty good preservation. The more I saw, the more I was eager to see, such being the nature of man. But I was checked in my anxiety at this time, for at the end of the passage I reached a large pit, which intercepted my progress. This pit is 30 feet deep and 14 feet by 12 feet 3 inches wide. The upper part of the pit is adorned with figures from the wall of the passage up to the ceiling. The passages from the entrance to this pit incline downward of an angle of 18 degrees. On the opposite side of the pit facing the entrance, I perceived a small aperture two foot wide and two foot six inches high. And at the bottom of the wall, a quantity of rubbish. A rope fastened to a piece of wood that was laid across the passage against the projections which formed a kind of door appears to have been used by the ancients to, for descending into the pen. And for <clears throat> the small aperture oil, the opposite side hung another which reached the bottom, no doubt, to ascend. We could perceive that the water which entered the passages from the torrents of rain ran into this pit, and the wood and rope fastened to it crumbled to dust on touching them. At the bottom of the pit were several pieces of wood placed against the side of it. To assist the person who was to ascend by the rope into the aperture, I saw a, the impossibility of proceeding at the moment. Mr. Beachy, whom that day came from Lexor, entered the tomb, but was also disappointed. The next day, the 19th, by means of a long beam, we succeeded in sending a man up into the aperture and having contrived to make a bridge of two beams, we crossed the pit. The little aperture we found to be Altilizagorst through a wall, and it had entirely closed the entrance, which was large as, which was as large as the corridor. The Egyptians had closely shut it up, plastered the wall over and painted it like the rest of the sides of the pit, so that but for the aperture it would have been impossible to suppose that there was any further proceeding and anyone would conclude that the tomb ended at the end of the pit. The rope in the rope in the inside of the wall did not fall to dust, but remained pretty strong. The water not having reached it at all, and the wood to which it was attached was in good preservation. It was owing to the method of keeping the damp out of the inner part, parts of the tomb that they are so well preserved. Adherbed some cavities at the bottom of the well, but found nothing in them, nor any communication from the bottom to any other place. Therefore, 
we could not doubt their being made to receive the waters from the rain with which happens occasionally in this mountain. The valley is so much raised by the rubbish which the water carries down from the upper parthe from the upper part they that the entrance into the into these tombs have become much lower than the turrets in consequence the water finds its way into the tombs some of which are entirely choked up with earth when we had passed through the little aperture we found ourselves in a beautiful hall 27 feet 6 inches by 25 feet 10 inches in which we in which were four pillars three foot square i shall not give any description of the painting until i have described the whole of the chambers at the end of this room which i call the entrance hall and opposite the aperture is a large door for which three steps lead down into a chamber with two pillars this is 28 feet 2 inches by 25 feet 6 inches the pillars are 3 feet 10 inches square I gave it the name of the drawing room for it is covered with figures which though only outlined are so fine and perfect that you would think they had been drawn only the day before Returning into the entrance hall, we saw on the left of the aperture a large staircase which descended into a corridor. It is 13 feet 4 inches long, 7 feet 6 inches wide, and has 18 steps. At the bottom we, were, we entered a beautiful corridor, 3.6 3 feet six inches by six feet eleven inches we perceived that the painting became more perfect as we advanced further into the interior they retained their gloss or a kind of varnish over the colors which had a beautiful effect the figures are painted on a white ground at the end of this Quarter, we descended ten steps, which I call the small stairs, into another seventeen foot two inch by ten feet five inch. From this, we entered a small chamber, twenty feet by four no, twenty feet four inch by thirteen feet eight inch, to which I gave the name of the room of of beauties for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures of basso relievo like all the rest and painted when standing in the center of this chamber the traveler is surrounded by an assembly of egyptian gods and goddesses proceeding farther we entered a large hall 27 feet 9 inches by 26 feet 10 inches in this hall are two rows of square pillars three on each side of the entrance forming a line with the corridor at each side of this hall is a small chamber that on the right is 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 8 inches that on the left 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 9 and a half inches this hall I termed the hall of pillars the little room on the right Isis room as it is a that at the Isis room as in it a large cow is painted of which I shall give a description hereafter 
that on the left the room of mysteries from the mysterious figures it exhibits. At the end of this hall we entered a large salon with an arched roof or ceiling which is separated from the hall of pillars only by a step so that the two may be reckoned one. The salon the salon is 31 feet 10 inches by 27 feet. On the right is a small chamber without any anything in it, roughly cut as if unfinished and without painting. On the left we entered a chamber with two square pillars, 25 feet by 8, in, uh, eight inches by 20 feet 10 inches. This I called the sideboard room, as it, is, as it has a projection of three feet in the form of a sideboard all around, which was perhaps intended to contain the articles necessary for the funeral ceremony. The pillars are three foot, four inch square, and the whole beautifully painted as the rest. At the same end of the room and facing the hall of pillars we entered by a large door into another chamber with four pillars, one of which is fallen down. This chamber is 43 foot 4 inches by 17 feet 6 inches. The pillars 3 feet 7 inches square it is covered with white plaster where the rock did not cut smoothly, but there is no paint on it. The bulls or apis room, as we found the carcass of a bull on it embalmed with asphaltum and also scattered in various places and in all immense quantity of small wooden figures of mummies six or eight inches long and covered with asphaltum to preserve them. There were some other figures of fine earth baked colored blue and strongly vanished. On each side of the two little rooms were wooden statues standing erect four foot high with a circular hollow inside as if to contain a roll of papyrus, which I have no doubt they did. We found likewise fragments of other statues of wood in, com in composition. But the description of what we found in the center of the salon in which I have reserved till this place merits the most particular attention, not having its equal in the world and being such as we had no idea could exist. It is a sarcophagus of the finest oriental alabaster, nine foot five inches long and three foot seven inches wide. Its thickness is only two inches and it is transparent when a light is placed in the inside of it. It is minutely sculptured within, within and without with several hundred figures which do not exceed two inches in height and represent as I suppose the whole of the funeral procession and ceremonies related to the deceased united with several emblems. I cannot give an adequate idea of this beautiful and invaluable piece of antiquity and can only say that nothing has been brought into Europe brought into Europe from Egypt that can be compared with it. The cover has 
The cover was not there. It had been taken out and broken into several pieces which we found in digging before the first entrance. The sarcophagus was over a staircase in the center of the salon which communicated with the subterraneous passage leading downwards 300 feet in length. At the end of this passage we found a great quantity of bats, a bat dung, which choked it up so that we could go no further without digging. It was nearly filled up too by the falling in of the upper part. 100 feet from the entrance is a staircase in good preservation, but the rock below changes its substance from a beautiful solid calcareous stone becoming a kind of black rotten slate which crumbles into dust only by touching. This subterraneous passage proceeds in a southwest direction through the mountain. I measured the distance from the entrance and also the rocks above and found that the passage reaches nearly halfway through the mountain to the upper part of the valley. I have reasons to suppose that this passage was used to come into the tomb by another entrance but this could not be after the death of the person who was buried there. For at the bottom of the stairs, just tender the sarcophagus, a wall was built which entirely closed the communication between the tomb and the subterranean passage. Some large blocks of stone were placed under the sarcophagus horizontally level with the pavement of the salon that no one might perceive any stairs or subterranean passage was there. The doorway of the sideboard room has been walled up and forced open as we found the stones with which it was shut and the mortar in the jams. The staircase of the entrance hall has been walled up also at the bottom and the space filled with rubbish and the floor covered with large blocks of stone to deceive anyone who should force the fallen wall near the pit and make him suppose that the tomb ended with the entrance hall and the drawing room. I am inclined to believe that whoever forced all these passages must have had some spies with them who were well acquainted with the tomb throughout. The tomb faces the northeast and the direction of the hole runs straight southwest.